Hello, everybody. Okay, looks like we've already got our recording going. Excellent. Hello, uh, I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm the executive director of All Brains Belong. Welcome to Brain Club. We're so glad you're here. Share screen and get us, get us oriented to our conversation. No, no, I don't want to share, like, share, share. I want to present. There we go. <laughs> Brain. Speaking of... Uh, of internalized ableism. We're going to be talking about internalized ableism at, at work tonight. And I'm really, really glad that you're all here. I think this is a topic that comes up um, for me every day of my life. And I know that that is the case for, for so many, so many people. And so shining a light on this, um, bringing this, um, normalizing conversations about this as, as you know, we're on this journey of, of, of unlearning together. Uh, closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. Depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon. If not, look for the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. You can do the same and choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. All right. Now, uh, it looks like looks like uh, some some new new folks to Brain Club tonight. Welcome. Um, what's Brain Club? It's our um, weekly community education program that we've uh, had running for almost three years now uh, for purposes of learning, learning together and unlearning together um, to demonstrate All Brains Belong's approach to the neuroinclusive culture to really try to shift broader community awareness. Um, you know, this is not not a not a neurodivergent affinity space by any means. We invite invite all people to come together to learn. Um, to promote new ways of thinking and being in the world, and with the hope that then, then y'all go out into your life and 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 now now uh, carry out um, some of the things that that you've learned here at Brain Club, and that's how together we transform culture. Um, this is a place where uh, we hope you'll you'll feel safe, um, and that uh, we'll feel we'll feel supportive. Um, but uh, this is not a support group. It's not a place for medical or mental health advice. It's not the right place to make personal requests or address personalized needs. Um, it's, it's about education together. So we invite you to listen, to learn, to observe, um, and think about how, how what you're learning connects to your life, if, if at all. As with all of our programs, uh, there is no one right way to participate. You can have your video on or off, even if it's on. We don't expect anything of you. We certainly do not need you to sit still or look at the camera or any of those other neuronormative constructs. Feel free to walk or fidget or stim or eat or take breaks. Um, when we do open up for questions and discussion, you're welcome to do that with mouth words or in the chat um, or, or not at all, because observation is a valid form of participation. There's never any pressure to, to communicate here. Um, and in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, um, uh, one of the other ways that, that we cue safety is of focusing on the collective community. That's actually the topic of next week's Brain Club, the shift from the individual to that of the collective all right, last last bit of access. Uh, that's that's my visual support to um, <laughs> remind myself to open the chat so I can see it. Welcome everybody. Okay, so now I can see the chat. We're ready to go. Um, so for those of you who are new to Brain Club, you 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 won't notice the difference um, that we made a major program format change a few weeks ago um, based on uh, community feedback. So this is a program where we'll have the next 45 minutes together. I'm going to briefly introduce the, the topic. And then we're going to watch um, a pre-recorded panel presentation. Um, out of respect to the panelists, uh, the chat will be disabled during the presentation. What it'll look like is we'll watch part one of the presentation. Chat will be turned off. And then we'll pause and we'll open up. Uh, we'll open the chat and we'll open up for mouth word uh, uh, participation with questions or comments. And then we'll go back and we'll watch the second part of the panel. Um, again, chat off and then open up for more questions and discussion. Um, and that's uh, that's how we'll spend our next 45 minutes together. 
Um, uh, Lizzie's going to share some comments, uh, some ideas in the chat for some just some ideas of how you might want to set up your space um, if that's new, because I think for many of us, the chat can be like a cognitive fidget, if you will. So um, other ideas for for uh, focus, for, uh, for, 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 for focus and regulation and all the things. Thanks, Lizzie. Um, the other thing that's been kind of coming up in our first few weeks of our new format is that sometimes it's hard um, to, you know, if you have an idea or a question, it's hard to to remember it by the time the chat opens back up. So some ideas uh, just to keep track of questions or comments as, as, uh, as they come up, whether that be to write or type or record a voice memo to yourself, just ways of supporting working memory so you don't have to tax your brain because it can be really burdensome to have to hold it all and still like also be taking in new information as you watch the panel. So just some ideas. All right. So we are beginning our new month theme. This month's theme is unlearning uh, old rules to create our path forward. And so the topics uh, the, the, the topics this month will all relate to that theme. That's what we do here. Um, uh, but before we begin, I'm just going to make an announcement. You know, I think that, you know, now, now more than ever, um, it's, 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 it's really community is the way forward. I think that um, so many of us, when it's, it's not clear what what to do. There there is always something we can do, and what we've been talking about, you know, in our community here is is it's 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 a it's a radical act of resistance to uh, resist withdrawing, resist isolating, and 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 reach out. And you're all doing that tonight. Um, and uh, very very fitting that today we kicked off our uh, bridging the gaps campaign. This is our end of year campaign where we are spreading awareness of neuroinclusive culture and our mission to make life better for people with all types of brains. Um, it's also a campaign to uh, raise raise uh, support for our free community programs such as Brain Club and Kid Connections, as well as our mutual aid support programs for our community members. And, and this is very exciting, we are trying to raise money to be able to expand and reopen to new patients in 2025. So um, I think that, you know, especially especially now, it really it becomes clear that the community demand community need is 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 vast. And we're going to do everything we can to be able to try to better, better commute, better meet community need. Um, thanks, Lizzie. So if you want to read more about the campaign and ways you can get involved, both in, you know, spreading, spreading awareness, spreading information, um, supporting the campaign in any, in any way, um, Lizzie put the link in the chat. And we are uh, more than more than halfway done toward toward our, our goal for the campaign, thanks to a generous matching donation from an ABB supporter. All gifts through the end of the year are actually going to be matched dollar for dollar. So we're very very excited about that. So already more 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 than half the way uh, done um, here on the first day of the campaign. So thank you thank you to everyone who has supported the campaign in any way. All right, here we go. Tonight's topic. So you know. Uh, we talk about internalized ableism. What's what's ableism? Ableism, uh, just like all of the other discriminatory isms, it's the it's it's the idea that anytime we designate that one group of people is superior to another, that is bad for health, for life, for a society where uh, everyone can get their needs met. And so this is part of that, right? So just like all the other isms, racism, um, uh, discrimination based on gender, sexuality, um, ableism is the discriminatory belief that it is superior to be abled, that it is superior to be able to do the thing. And this can be intentional or unintentional. And often when we talk about all of the isms that of course are all, um, all, all, uh, overlapping and, uh, and, and and related to one another. And especially when we think about, um, you know, intersectional identities, uh, community members who are marginalized for multiple aspects of identity. Um, this, this, this piece um, is often missing from the broader community conversations. So what internalized ableism is, is what it sounds like. It's the idea that over the course of someone's life, there are these messages because of the explicit and implicit messages that are given over the course of a lifetime, um, that it is superior to be abled um, when someone is not able 
um, there is a narrative, a narrative from other people, um, a narrative from society at large that that becomes internalized. And this takes um, a, a toll. And I think that um, uh, what we talk about here at Brain Club often is the idea that um, society gives the message that there's one lane to go down, one way to do the thing, and one way, way to think, to learn, to act, to regulate, to play, like one right way to be a person. And we know, of course, that that's not, not true. And yet, because those messages are sent explicitly and implicitly, these messages, these narratives become internalized. And it can, um, the, the, the hard work of unlearning this, uh, we believe is, is best done in community. And yet it is not easy and it is not instant. It is a long road of internalizing these traumatic narratives. What we do not want is we do not want the square peg being hammered to fit into the round hole, but that's what exists in so many spaces, in particular in most workplace environments. Um, and when we think about um, the social model of disability, where the amount of disability that someone experiences is relative to the barriers in the world, um, we have so many workplace environments where there are barriers to access, and yet the narrative is internalized. That's our fault. So um, we're going to watch a pre-recorded conversation with our staff team um, at All Brains Belong um, about this topic and how this topic plays out in our own lives. And uh, we'll have time to then debrief and discuss. I'm going to stop my share screen. I'm going to make my volume louder and then I'll start the video. Mm -hmm. What? Okay. Reshare with my sound. There we go. See, what's the last thing I cried about? It's always math, but what was it? Remember? I can tell the story of it if we remember what it was. Taxes. Mm -hmm. It's like payroll mm -hmm. taxes. Right? Yeah. It's like always. Yeah. It's always like anytime there is a cognitively demanding task. Mm, that's not the right word. Every time there is a big multi step task involving complex number things and shifting back and forth between windows and screens and math my brain just starts shutting down and then the thing becomes actually harder to do as my battery is decreasing and then i'm like no no no, but i just gotta finish it but like i don't actually have the resources to finish it and then i like to see her's point i like push through you gotta finish the thing and then inevitably i will reach this critical place where now i flip my lid um, and now I'm like crying over the spreadsheets and I'm like, you know, in those moments, that's where internalized ableism comes in because now I am not only incompetent at my task, you know, the one that wasn't set up for my brain and that I was never instructed on how to do and I've never done before, right? So that plus this belief like, or, or this narrative of like, there I go again, whenever there's a there I go again, that is like fast track of like shame. And because it's like, it's like everything, there I go again in social situations, there I go again. And I, 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 I think it dissipates sooner because I know that there's a lot of people who have there I go again cycles.
Well, I really like how you described that, like, that brain shutting down. I, like, can't do the thing anymore, but I'm still pushing through as that's kind of the inciting point. And that's definitely, I, I think I, I, I saw a pattern of that happening most nights at, like, 9 or 10 p.m. as I was finishing notes and being like, it's just, it's, you know, and for me, I think instead of the like, um, there I go again pattern, it's the like, everybody else can do this. Why can't I pattern the like, you know, other people are seeing twice as many patients as I am in a day and getting their notes done. Why am I like still struggling to do this so much and trying to get my brain to do it? And then the kind of realization of, oh, this is a pattern and I can just talk with my employer and reorient my schedule and like move something that actually works better for my brain and actually, you know, do work when my brain is actually wanting to do work more. Um, but it, you know, it takes months often of kind of going through that, like, oh, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't me not, not being good enough. Yeah. The not good enough, like the not, it's like, I think it all comes back to like, you know, you're not good enough or you're too much. It's like, you're too much. You're not enough. And like, both of those are bad for health. I think a lot of the, pe the a lot of the people that we support, they're not surrounded by people who are on the journey of unlearning. They're surrounded by people who are either actively shaming them for their differences or not engaging with this at all. And like the silence and like the non-commentary lets people like beast in their shame and their childhood narratives and all of it. I don't know. What do y'all think about that? And it's letting people sit in that isolation of, oh, nobody else is struggling with this, so it must just be something about me. Um, yeah. In our one of our employment support groups, um, we were engaging with financial stuff. And I told the story of, like, how did I you know, as someone who like, you know, learned they have a math learning disability at age 37, like the, the, the math thing, the number thing, like it's really, it's really hard. I had to learn like a lot of like compensatory strategies to like live in the world, let alone like run an organization. And the people in the group were like, I think that no one had ever, no one had ever named that these things like they literally thought they were the only ones they literally they were like shocked that like we were a whole group of people who struggle in this way like why don't people talk about this i think that's because well i think one of the reasons is because if you're if the only times you talk about that you're getting met with either dismissiveness or like not engaging in it if if when you're saying you know this is too confusing i need to slow it down or when you're saying i didn't understand could you repeat it a different way or when you're saying my brain's done and i need to take a break and nobody's listening to that you pretty quickly just kind of learn to not say it And I think that happens a lot in the workplace too. And then when you overhear other people talking negatively about, you know, work environment or coworkers or, you know, that whole like not good boundaries environment, you know that everyone's going to be talking about you too, then you don't say anything, right? So it's also, yeah, yeah that. Even though we have these conversations a lot that doesn't like actually insulate us from you know, these little episodes, these little episodes where like the old way creeps up. Anybody have any stories of a, of a recent time when 
internalized ableism reared its ugly head? I think I I pretty constantly have external reminders from UMail that like we don't have to keep doing it because it's the system we're using right now. Things can change. Um, and I think I think that, you know, goes with the, the comfort of systems being the same and fear of change and all that type of stuff. But the the kind of yeah, I guess the, the internalized ableism of the systems, you know, not great for me, but like I'm just gonna push through and it's gonna be fine. It's easier to just push through it. Um that that definitely feels like a like head down push through kind of internalized ableism. Yeah. Well, I think I feel the same the same way as what Sierra just said. It's definitely still very much a part of my everyday life where I push through. Yeah. Um, and fr not think about that there's other ways to do things or there's um, support um, for that. Yeah, so it's definitely still an automatic because I also am continuing to learn about my brain. There's so much I don't know. Um, and so it's it's almost as much work for me to think about not thinking about pushing through as it is to push through. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're like triaging, you know, like triaging mm -hmm. energy and bandwidth, like advocate, inquire, try on, learn a new way. Like that just, that's too yeah. much. It's more daunting. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get that. I get that. There's like, there's like the conscious calculation of that, that load, that cognitive load of, of a new way. And then there's, I think a lot of people, there's like the, I don't want people to know that I'm struggling. I don't want people to judge me. I don't want people to think less of me. I don't want people, you know, even like, I don't know, I think, and it's like different audiences. Like I might, I think, I think I had to unlearn a lot of my medical training. It's like, you don't talk about yourself transparently. There's like this wall between you and the patient where it's like actually engaging with your patients that you struggle in many of the same ways that they do, that, that can be actually quite therapeutic. Anyone else done any unlearning? I think for me, if I'm going to implement something new, like a new way that's going to take cognitive energy, um, also being on a team where I see others implementing these things first really helps me. I need to see it like enough times um, over and over before I take that step and think, oh, maybe I could try this for myself instead of just pushing through. It's like me using ChatGPT every five seconds. Finally, you tried a new way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I really like that, Lizzie, because I think for me, it brings up the idea of how important kind of modeling that behavior is for, for other people. Um, I think it also brings up the idea of, you know, I, 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 I don't want to and I feel shame and that kind of modeling reduces the shame. But then I think there's also still the, I don't want somebody else to have to pick up the burden of me not being able to do this. I don't want somebody else to have to do this horrible task or I don't want, you know, somebody to have to put a lot of extra work into teaching me how to do it or whatever that looks like. Um, and I think that's a big one that I definitely see continuing to pop up. like a challenge to core concept thing like it's like a you know we talk like on our team right we talk about like you know core values of how we want to be perceived versus like core anti-values these are the things that are really important to me that i'm not perceived it's really important to me to not be perceived as incompetent 
it's like a core anti-value. Um, I have lots of core anti-values and that's one of them. And I think for me, that's the one that comes up around, or like that is like directly connected to internalized ableism. Cause like the thing that I need help with, if I have that, the, the narrative of I'm supposed to be able to do this and I'm not, that connects to core anti-value. As, as soon as I'm like, oh, of course I am struggling with this. It's not set up for my brain. Um, and I've never done it before. And no one's ever shown me. And, 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 um, it's just like a completely different experience. And that same exact experience does not connect to core anti-value. It's the same presentation. Um, it's the same people that I'm interacting with that might like know that I don't know how to do the thing. Um, but it's a complete, it, it, it's just different. Does anyone, has anyone else experienced that? I think that's why the social model of disability is so important. Because that does that kind of this isn't this isn't me, this is the world not meeting my needs. And that's a really, really big frame shift. Well, it's kind of like like last week we held our event for our patients about navigating the Vermont Health Exchange, which is this like astronomically burdensome activity. And in a group um, where the whole time we're like, yeah, this is absurd. This, like, yeah, no one understands this. No one understands this. I don't understand this. I work in healthcare and I don't understand this. Um, here are some workarounds, some strategies that I have devised over time and we can work through this together. But like, fundamentally, it's not you. It's this thing makes no sense. And like, I don't know, I think, I think that's important because like when you're when you're in the face of struggle when you blame yourself as opposed to like the task or the environment like not blame is not the right word but like you know, attribution like the struggle is because of me as opposed to the struggle the struggle is because of all like even having a menu of possibilities of things that are not you um to explain why it is hard I, um, what's coming up for me here um, okay so we're gonna pause and open this up for for discussion or questions before we watch the second half of our panel um uh what's what's standing out to me and watch watching that first off i'm just really i'm really grateful for our team i really just we have the best team ever um is is like how every day this stuff is and yet um i had never thought or talked about this ever until you know fairly recently and i wonder just how many other people move through their day um with these these experiences that they they haven't had the opportunity of shifting their narrative um like like what came up at the end there i'm gonna read in the chat hi liz um uh Liz says, um, I want to name a, a facet of internalized ableism that I haven't heard here yet. The idea of dismissing a task that comes easily due to having the unique uh, viewpoint or skill set or hyper-connected brain that sees everything coming together. And then because it comes so easily, we downplay it. It's the opposite of uh, Sears. Why can't I do what everyone else can do? And at least for me, doing things easily is like invisible to me. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that um, it's like the way I the way I taught my you know uh, my child when they were three years old is we all have different brains. Some things come easily to us. Some things come more difficult. It's just a neutral description. It just is, Sierra. Um, I really like that, Liz. I think I see that a lot in. Um, dismissing and kind of having invisible tasks that are fairly easy for me, but still kind of demand a requirement um, and forgetting that there are things that are like actually still cognitively draining. You know, if I'm somebody who 
really doesn't mind, um, you know, making a phone call, but I still have to make a phone call and that's still some cognitive drain and kind of forgetting that, oh yeah, I've actually done all of these things today. It's not that I've, you know, wasted my day or whatever that looks like. Totally. Just the, 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 the minimizing and the discounting of, of, of effort and struggle and, you know, all of it. Um, lots of lots of lots of comments about this idea of the the core anti value. Yeah, I I I I find at least for me that lens is uh, that that helps me not in the moment but later understand of like why some things are so dysregulating to me. It's because they connect directly with my like these things that are really deeply important that I not be perceived in this way. Michelle. Hi. Um, yeah, there's a lot of this that that um, I definitely can resonate with. But when you were listing off, um, you're saying that there's um, you, you're like these people are being surrounded by people who are either actively shaming them or not engaging at all with with like this metacognition about it. Um, I think there's a third option too, or third scenario where you get the people who have got this toxic fake positivity and tell you, oh, you 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 should be thinking this and that about yourself and instead of you know putting yourself down. But it's like I need to have someone connect the dots between one thing and another to just tell me I need to be um you know, I need to not be so negative or whatever. I need someone to like show me the path to get there. If I'm stuck in this flip out because I've reached my saturation point. You know, for one thing, your 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 amygdala is is like in high gear and your hippocampus is not working anymore. So you're not reasonable you're not you're not gonna be able to be reasoning anyways because you're in a flip out already. But it's like I need someone to like help me like breathe and calm down and regulate and then show me the the way to connect the dots to get from one point to the other. Does that make Definitely. any sense? Absolutely. You know, I, I think, I think, Michelle, that, you know, even just the idea that some other person comes and tells you how to, how you should think is just, you know, a red flag for me, for sure. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, for it's me, very yeah. dismissive or something. It's, yeah. it's, it's minimizing. It, 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 it absolutely can be really, it's, another, really it's, it's like shame in disguise. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for naming that. Thank you. Monique and then Mary, and then I'm going to move us, move, I'll respond to a couple uh, comments in the chat after that, and then I'm going to move us back to our second half. Monique. Okay, thank you. Um, in listening, I was thinking how, for me anyways, perfectionism is like a close cousin to internalized ableism. And, uh, and the book by Devin Price, Laziness Does Not Exist, really helped me to unpack it's not about internalized ableism, but it really helped me unpack it and recognize areas in my life where I am judging and shaming and making it far harder on myself than it needs to be. <laughs> that is, I mean, it's it's so common. I mean, I see it in my in my seven year old already, and I'm going to put a link in the chat. Characteristics of white supremacy culture that like once I'm going to put this right here we go um once once I was exposed to the concept that perfectionism um is is um you know connected to values that I would you know reject um it it for me that really like was a very big shift in my own like unlearning of perfectionism because I I didn't know I didn't know the cultural values that 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 led led to that um, though certainly experienced it. Thanks, Monique. Mary. Hi, uh, it's my first time here. So hi, everybody. I'm happy to be here. Um, I just wanted to share, a, I guess, about really relating to the um, anti-value. I never heard, I never heard of that phrase. And it, it's, um, amazing when you kind of realize there's an anti-value that's driving the bus from like an invisible point that <laughs> you don't know who's driving the bus but it's this anti-value thing and i like as you talked about it i had a re remembering just yesterday or <clears throat> recently when you know i was taking notes during work 
and someone said something to me and I, I looked up from taking a note and I said, oh, it was over Zoom. And I, and I said, oh, I'm sorry. What did you say? You broke up just there. And that was totally a lie. It was a lie to cover this anti-value of looking capable and looking like I can do two things at once, which I cannot do two things at once. I can barely do one thing at once. And I, I, you know, just like lying for a reason that like, I'm, I'm kind of having my mind blown right now, to be honest, like perfectionism being related to white supremacy culture. Holy cow. When you slow it down and start asking yourself, what is it that I'm doing here? Why am I getting behind a, a perfectionist value when that has nothing to do with anything else that I'm about. In fact, it's kind of opposite if you know these things. Um, and meanwhile, I'm chipping away at my self-esteem, you know, it's sad. It's sad. And, and, and you're not alone. You're not alone. And I think that's why I'm, I'm so glad you're here because so for so many people, it's like the idea of like coming to a group of people who are on this journey and someone names the thing and you're like, oh, whoa. And then you start connecting it to other ideas. And then you move through your day and you're like, whoa. And then once you see it, you can't unsee it. And it the shift happens. And yeah. not to say it's overnight, but it, like you've just begun that journey. And that's, yeah. um, it's, it's really painful. And um, it's a really big deal. And congratulations on that shift. I'm really glad you're here. Yeah. Yeah. And lots of, lots of, lots of people in the chat, like really resonating with what you said. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so much, it's so much. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to return us, but return us to, uh, to part two. If I can figure out how to reshare screen. All right, here we go. Uh, is not working hold on i think it'll just there we go we'll just hopefully that's not gonna like start over hold on all right so i'm gonna model like so here i am with the internalized ableism brain club and i can't play the video hold on um Just don't start over. Of course, that's what's gonna happen. Okay. So what's the last thing? All right, I've hold on. Like, on the other hand, the fact that all right, we might have a, a a brief repetition of like thirty seconds. I think it's for the best. It's not like a um like a standard. A standard size, effect. right? Yeah, because there's many of us, and right. we all have different brains. Um, right. We might have to keep changing things, even though all of us have an access need for predictable systems. Right. Um, and so it's that balance of predictable systems. I mean, this is actually probably something worth naming for in this panel somewhere. Is like. You know, when you have the kind of brain that derives safety from predictable systems and needs novelty and tends toward like entropy and chaos, like you're going to have mm -hmm. to reinvent your systems. Right. And that always feels like it, right? Like, like I feel like a little kid looking around my bedroom of like, how did it get so chaotic again? And so it's like the same thing in, at, at age 40 of like, how did my desk get like this again? Well, it's because the system is breaking down um, the system, you know, many systems are breaking down. And it's like that balancing that, especially when your systems impact other people and other people also have their own systems. It's just like an awareness of the ecosystem of which each of us is one part. Like, just like, just, I don't know. I, I find that even just like, acknowledging that like naming that like yep yeah, it's a conflicting access need situation like i don't know helps me not have like 
Well, that's interesting, Olivia. What your what what your comment is making me think about. What I was gonna say. I was gonna say like it helps me not have like um like an emotionally negative, you know, experience of a team member. But does that make it more likely that I direct my negative emotional experience at myself? I don't know. Like, where's my angst go? My angst has to go somewhere. And does like accounting for angst in the workplace, like, is that important? Like, is that, like, where is it gonna go? It's energy, right? It's like the way that like my child comes from school and like screams and runs around, like, my angst doesn't go anywhere. It stays here. I feel like one of the hard parts is it's, at least for me, it's often directed at large systemic structures that I have no control or agency over, but also just like no connection to. Like there's nobody I can like get angry at necessarily. Um, and that that makes it feel like even though the angst is necessarily, it's directed at something or someone, it's such a big kind of amorphous concept of like the healthcare industry or something like that, that it's hard when there's nothing super specific or not a specific, I guess nothing super specific to direct it to. Unless it's Vermont Medicaid when they took back $13,000. That's staying in the video. Right. Um. Can it stay in the video? Yeah. Great. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's the thing is it's, there's so much, I feel like we're like, because I feel like I'm often butting my head against a brick wall when I'm trying to kind of like interface with the traditional healthcare system. And then every once in a while, there'll be something soft that, there's actually like a place that I can focus all my attention on, like, you know, a uh, insurance company stopping covering medication that all my patients really need or taking money back um, or, you know, whatever it is. And, and it is a lot of that anger kind of gets directed at, at that specific thing. Um, but I also think that's okay because it's a big system. Well, it's also like you, I think our nervous systems have to go through like the cycle, like you have, like, you know, you, 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 you get angsty and dysregulated and then like, there's gotta be some kind of like repair or closure. And we don't get that. We don't get it. There is no closure. There is no resolution. There are systems that just screw everyone over. And then it's like on to the next thing of like, oh yeah, well, the only, the only closure I have is because it's like whack-a-mole with my nervous system of like, you know, actually I was really angsty at this and now I'm really angsty at this. And like, guess what? That's going to take a toll on my executive functioning. So like when I forget until today that we have to have a brain club recording, it's like, well, yeah, like what was my nervous system doing? It was managing whack-a-mole. Definitely see that my angst decreases when it's shared with somebody. I think, I think the same way with shame. Like, I think that's one thing I like about when Olivia and I are in the office together is I feel like I definitely angst dissipates when we can talk about, oh, I was just, you know, on hold with the pharmacy for this long, or I just had to deal with this ridiculous thing with the insurance company. And it definitely the angst dissipates a little bit, I think, when it when it can be shared. Also, just being in a space with Olivia helps my angst dissipate. Absolutely agree. <laughs> yeah, for me, I um, had to revamp one of my email follow-up systems recently. And before I had the system, I was trying to use a spreadsheet to keep track of everything. And then since I had that spreadsheet already, I just kept thinking, oh, I should get the hang of it and 
be able to keep all my notes in this place and keep it organized because it's already been set up for me and you know, I should just get it together. And then um, it probably took me about two months to make the switch and be like, okay, I really need to take it out of the spreadsheet and like put it in um, a document in the way that works best for me, which is tables and really break down the system into little steps, which really helps my dyspraxic brain. Um, and then once I did that, I felt this like huge weight off my shoulders and just realized that, you know, it's the system that everything was in that didn't work for my brain, the spreadsheet. And, and that's okay. Spreadsheets work for some brains and they don't work for mine very well. So, um, and once I've changed now to the new system, the task feels a lot less daunting. Like I feel like I can actually initiate it and, and do it. And instead of just spinning my wheels, I really love that normalizing Lizzie of that. It like switches like this are going to take a while and that's, and that's okay. And it's not a failure if it, you know, takes a month of somebody suggesting something for me to do it. Um, that's just, how it's going to happen sometimes but then there's also like the pda thing right like the pda thing of like someone suggesting something you know your limbic system may not perceive as safe right so it just is so it's like i don't know i feel like energetically like if i'm noticing like you know a breakdown i think like that maybe that's another important take-home point like when there is a a breakdown, whatever that is, like, you know, whether that is like, you know, a, a task gets dropped or someone just feels exhausted, like those are both breakdowns. Um, you work backwards. It's like, yep, this was an unmet access need. That's that's what this is, like 95% of the time. Um, and to like do the do the work of like analysis of what it was, like some someone may not have access to that at that time. But it still remains that there is an unmet access in situation and we have to like figure out, I think it's just like transparency about like, yep, there's an access need situation. I don't know how to solve it, but it's like something's not working. But you need like a shared vocabulary on a team, I think. This is why I think every workplace needs a neuro needs neurodiversity training. The environment has to cue safety before you're gonna you know talk about yourself people have yeah. to be modeling it you know and it it comes from the Can you imagine <laughs> imagine people authentically talking about themselves what a world right but like you know, that, that, that culture like i'm i'm doing a i'm, I'm doing a bunch of neuro-inclusive uh supervision workshops on wednesday and um like you know i'm going to talk about culture and tone and all that stuff and it's like you can't, you have to like actually see the world differently. If you see the world differently, then, you know, your, your tone changes, but you can't just be like, today I'm going to arrive and I'm going to be a neuro-inclusive supervisor. Like you have to actually believe that we all have different brains and different brains have different needs. Mm -hmm. And you have to talk about your own brain and you have to, you know, model that it's like, okay to struggle. Like you have to do that explicitly all the time. All right, I'm very tired. Can we be done? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we have enough to work with. Thank you all so much. Thank you. So uh, we probably have time for maybe we we've already gone over. Maybe we have time for the one question or comment. Someone, anyone we haven't heard from yet, who has anything that they'd like to like to name? Jamie, I love that. The law of the conservation of angst. Angst cannot be created or destroyed. Just that's funny. <laughs> I love that. Paul, I love your unicorn emoji so much. I don't even know that that's you. I'm just assuming that's you. Anyway, what I'm hoping 
what I'm hoping um, that 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 folks uh, took took today um, or took away today um, is the idea that um, uh, this concept of access needs things we all need for full and meaningful participation in anything we're doing. So in this case at work, and when there's a breakdown, I feel tired, I drop the ball, whatever. It, it, it most of the time relates to an unmet access need. And, you know, coming to Brain Club, accessing some of our additional free resources. Um, uh, Lizzie, if you can drop the link to the neuroinclusive employment, the free resources link, that would be awesome. Um, uh, the, the idea is to like learn about this stuff. You're not going to just snap your fingers and be like, I know exactly like what my, what I need right now. Um, knowing what you need is like complicated, but at least to be able, like, at least for, for me, the first step was um, something bad happens. And for me not to automatically assume that it's my fault, like to have anything else on the menu, that was the first step. Martha says in the chat, like someone mentioned already, the added friction necessary for us to deal really drains us of spoons. Yeah, the pressure to mask, the pressure to appear a certain way, um, consistent with the you know neuronormative values of the culture, um, that absolutely takes up so many cognitive resources that I don't know would be better uh, spent on actually doing your work, but that's. You don't get you don't get to pick you don't get to pick what drains your battery and so again like bringing bringing this lens you know is is part of the process so thank you everyone thank you so much for being part of this conversation today um, and uh, thank you to our all brains belong team uh, for for modeling vulnerability and authenticity and in in, in uh, reflecting on these processes. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll hope to see you all back next week. Um, so next week um, uh, will be approximately one month of the new format of Brain Club 2.0. And we've got our uh, Brain Club um, 2.0 uh, community uh, team um, who has recorded a reflection on the first month of Brain Club 2.0. We'll see what 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 you all think about um, the, some of the, the reflections that come up. We're going to be talking specifically about uh, the component of neuroinclusive culture, where we shift from the individual experience to that of the collective. So uh, we we look forward to seeing you then. Have a good week. Bye, everybody.